Well, welcome everyone and thank you for joining this uh, GRSS webinar hosted by the Earth Science Informatics Technical Committee. My name is Manu Maske and I work at NASA and also uh, uh, co-chairing the Earth Science Informatics Technical Committee. And today I would like to um, introduce our first presenter, Dr. Brian Freitag, who is uh, a research scientist here at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. He's also the project lead for the NASA's Harmonized Landsat Sentinel Data Production Project. Uh, as you might have already know, today's topic is maximizing Earth science observations with data harmonization uh, with the title Harmonized Landsat Sentinel-2. Uh, Brian will also be joined by Dr. Jeff Masick and Dr. Farhan Gascon. Um, Dr. Jeff Masick is from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. He's the Deputy Project Scientist for Landsat 8 and the Project Scientist for Landsat 9 mission. Uh, Dr. Gascon is uh, Copernicus Sentinel-2 mission manager with the European Space Agency. He is also involved in the development of uh, CHIME, LSTM, and Sentinel-2 next generation missions. Uh, I think the way we will structure this is uh, that we'll let uh, Brian finish his talk and then uh, Dr. Gascon will be uh, giving his perspective from uh, ESA's side and then we'll move on to panel discussion. Um, not sure, uh, Brian, whether you want people to interrupt you while you're talking or we can put all the question at the end. It's your call. Yeah, yeah. I think for the most part, I'm, I'm usually pretty laid back about questions. I think if we get to a point where we start running short on time, then maybe we'll push them to the end, but <clears throat> please feel free to ask questions in the middle of the presentation. All right, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks, Manil. Let me go ahead and share my screen and. Um, start, where is the share screen? <laughs> there it is, okay. Um, share this one. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yeah, can you make a full screen? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Oops, you can swap, swap this way. Place. Yeah. Great. All right, should be good to go? Yes. Okay, <laughs> great. So yeah, as Manel mentioned, uh, my name is Brian Freitag. I'm a research scientist here at NASA Marshall. Uh, I lead the production of the Harmonized Landsat Sentinel data products for NASA. Those products were initially done at Goddard Space Flight Center under the direction of Jeff Masick, who's joining us. And so that's why we've got him here uh, to help us with this uh, webinar. Um, and so I'll go ahead and just jump right in uh, and give you guys an overview of HLS. So what really is it? What do we mean when we say harmonize? So I think one of the things that is starting to become a bit more of a buzzword within the earth science community is this harmonization of data products. So what do we mean here? And, and with respect to HLS specifically, we're looking at using data from two similar instruments. So we've got the multispectral imager on Sentinel-2, we've got the optical land imager on Landsat-8, which have really similar spectral band characteristics. We wanna use data from those two instruments and essentially merge them so that they can be used interchangeably. And there's some algorithmic uh, work that has to be done to make that happen. But for the most part, you should not be able to distinguish a Sentinel-2 observation from a Landsat-8 observation within the Harmonized Landsat Sentinel products. So that's the goal anyway. And so the idea here is essentially to leverage those harmonizations, or sorry, those special similar similarities uh, to produce essentially a virtual constellation. So essentially now, Landsat 8 becomes part of the Sentinel 2A and Sentinel 2B constellation. And when Landsat 9 comes in, we'll essentially make that all part as one similar uh, constellation. So why can we actually do this? What are the actual characteristics of both instruments? So you can see swath width is roughly about the same. It's not as important. Uh, our repeat cycles are about 10 and 16 days uh, per instrument. Uh, but then if you get down to the spectral coverage range, uh, we're looking really similar here at, at the spectral coverage. Uh, Multispectral imager has a few more bands than Landsat does, and we'll get into those specifics here a little bit later. But for the most part, you can see that the two instruments themselves are quite similar in terms of what they're actually sensing within the electromagnetic spectrum. So when we say a, a virtual constellation, what do we actually mean by that? This is a really nice graphic uh, that the Science Visualization Studio put together. Um, and so essentially, if you just have Landsat 8 in orbit, this is what you get when you look at the globe. You kind of get this really sparse view 
of the land surface. Uh, as you throw in Landsat 9, you start to see that we start to fill in some of these gaps. You throw in Sentinel-2A, you see we start to fill in that gap a little bit more, and then here comes Sentinel-2B. And then before you know it, with the four satellites in total, you can get a near global coverage uh, every day at 30 meter resolution, or at least 30 meters or less uh, if you use them at their native resolution. And so you can see that we can get a really nice uh, visual of the, the Earth, similar to what we can get with MODIS that's currently at one kilometers. And so it's a really nice way for us to potentially greatly improve our land surface uh, monitoring observations. So again, we're looking at merging these two data streams um, Currently with Landsat 8, Sentinel-2A, and Sentinel-2B, we're looking at roughly two to four days uh, for us to get full global coverage. Uh, there is a caveat there. Obviously, clouds in the tropics play a significant role. And so this graphic down here in the bottom left shows you about how long you can expect uh, between cloud-free observations. So you know, in the desert regions, you typically would get a cloud-free observation uh, every overpass. But you may have to skip a couple uh, in you know, regions where clouds are really pronounced, like the tropics or uh, over terrain. As I mentioned, this was something that was started at uh, NASA Goddard, and then it's been moved to uh, Marshall, uh, basically to take that existing algorithm, which was for targeted regions over the globe. I think it was something on the order of about 120 targeted regions that, that the algorithm is being executed on. And we really wanted to expand that out to global coverage, which meant we had to scale in, in multiple ways. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. But this is just generally the overview. And I think what we're trying to show here in the top right is essentially the real meat of the harmonized Landsat Sentinel products over you know, typical just Landsat observations or Sentinel observations is that you add in the different observations to, to fill out that time series. So you can see some of these grayed out ones maybe are uh, Sentinel-2 observations or the Landsat observations. And then these colored uh, observations here at the top would be the Sentinel observations. Essentially, we intersperse them and really start to fill out that time series analysis to really understand what's happening at the land surface. So some specifics about the different products and their bands. So we've got 13 bands that are listed here for uh, the HLS S30 product, which is the Sentinel component. You can see the band numbers. Uh, you can see the wavelengths that you have on the right. All these units are going to be in reflectance, uh, given where they are in the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and then the way that we do this is we essentially output one data band per file. So band one is in its own file, band two is in its own file. And we get into that a little bit more, but essentially we package this up as 13 individual band files that are sent uh, for Sentinel. Same thing for uh, the Landsat product. So this is a Landsat component. You can see that we've got you know, our bands in the, in the, uh, through the shortwave IR. They're all in reflectance values. We have the thermal IRs, which are in degrees. But again, all of these uh, bands that are that come with the Landsat 8 um, and Landsat 9 now, they are all contained in a single band file. So band 1 and, and file 1, band 2 and file 2, and so forth. So like I mentioned, we took this algorithm and we basically went from uh, those select targeted regions uh, over the globe and then we wanted to expand this out to global coverage. But I want to at least make one point of clarification first. Uh, when we say global coverage area, this is exactly what we mean. So essentially what we do is we, we find the intersection of any uh, MGRS tiles that intersect uh, any landmass um, based on the NOAA coastlines data set. And then we, we essentially just map that to uh, our HLS grid. The exception is that we do not include Antarctica. So Antarctica is not included in our global coverage, but every other landmass globally uh, is included in our product. So how do we actually make this work? So like I mentioned, we've got two different instruments that are providing input data. Um, obviously, they both need to be atmospherically corrected. Uh, they're both geometrically resampled so that they're on the analysis ready grid that we define. Um, and then we do our BRDF normalization, but then we have to do the band pass adjustment. And the band pass adjustment is essentially what we do to make the Sentinel-2 products look like the Landsat-8 products. And so it's a simple algorithm that we apply to the bands themselves, and there's an algorithm per band that we can then apply to basically make it so that uh, band three for uh, the S30 products matches band three for the Landsat-8 product, uh, and so forth and so on. So that's essentially how that algorithm will work. And so what does that actually mean? So if you look at these uh, two top, um, these essentially, sorry, let me take a step back. 
So these are the, the bands, the, the bands from Landsat 8 and from Sentinel 2. And so Landsat 8 is this middle one here, Sentinel 2 is the top one. And you can see where they essentially will overlap. You've got band seven for Landsat 8 matches with band 12 uh, for Sentinel 2, band six with band 11, five with eight, and so, or sorry, five with 8A. But you can see that the, they're not exactly the same. And so in order for us to make these appear exactly the same, we have to apply that band pass adjustment such that the band, when we compare band seven with Landsat 8 with band 12 from Sentinel 2, or in our case, the HLS L30 product with the HLS S30 product, the, the data that you look for from band seven with HLS L30 matches the data that you get from HLS S30 in the Sentinel 2 product. And that's essentially what we mean when we say a band pass adjustment. It's essentially making these bands uh, such that they're as close to identical as possible. It will never be, never be perfect, but as close as we can get them. So I mentioned that we had to kind of scale this up a little bit. So initially this was being run on 120 different uh, targeted regions over the globe. We wanted to expand this out to that global coverage area that we showed before. Um, and so we essentially had to take the existing alg algorithm as it was and try to optimize it a little bit so that we could get this running at a, a much larger scale uh, than what we currently were, or what we were running previously. So we essentially did, a, I think it was something on the order of about a four times increase in our throughput that we were trying to support. And so this is just a general overview of what that looks like. And this is the simpler diagram. We'll get into a more detailed uh, architecture diagram below. Um, but initially what we do is we get this data from USGS. All their data is available uh, on AWS. It is a requester pays bucket. Uh, so we do pay for that data. Um, but we get this data that they stage from AWS. We ingest that directly into our L30 processing system. We have the LACERC model, which is our atmospheric correction model, which then generates the L30 product. Within that L30 product, we have metadata uh, that goes with the product. That's both uh, standard metadata for CMR and stack metadata that we use for some more cloud native visualizations or uh, analysis platforms. We have a browse image that goes with it. I'll show you an example of what that looks like coming in a little bit, uh, a little bit later. And then we have data. So we talked about those 13 data bands. We also include four angle bands uh, within those data packages for both L30 and S30. For ESA, their data is not available in AWS. Uh, so what we do is we essentially have a downloader script that we use from the International Hub to get data from ESA into our processing system. That downloader script triggers then our workflow. It goes through the atmosphere correction model that's supported by USGS or provided by USGS, I should say. That then again generates that S30 product and then all that uh, granule, the, the, the granule package that we talked about previously with L30 is similar for S30, just with the additional bands. I think I mentioned that S30 has 13 data bands, L30 has nine. Uh, so that's essentially the difference uh, within that, but everything else is the same there. And so what we do is whenever we produce a granule, we push that data then to our S3 bucket and it's staged and NASA distributes that through their distributed active archive centers. And this one specifically is the land processes stack. Um, and so we stage that data for them to come in and grab it and then for them to host it and distribute it out to the general public. And I'll show you how we do that uh, coming up a little bit later. But then we also are generating browse imagery. And so this is the global imagery browse service uh, that NASA uses. Uh, if you're familiar with the NASA Worldview platform, it's essentially the imagery behind the NASA Worldview platform. We also stage imagery for them to come and retrieve. And then they essentially send us a, a message back to say, yep, we were able to get it or no, we weren't. Uh, and if there was a failure on our side, then we essentially will go back and then resend those granules back uh, so that they can come in and, and ingest them. So let me go ahead with the more technical diagram. I don't want to get too in depth like I did previously, um, but essentially just know that we've got everything working within the cloud. So we have uh, our Lambda functions that trigger uh, based on this downloader from the International Hub. We have our Lambda function that triggers off of the uh, SNS topic that we subscribe to for uh, USGS. And then that will go ahead and generate uh, the imagery and the, uh, the data that we send to both LPDAC and to uh, Gibbs. And I think I wanna show this here mostly just to say that it took us a while to get to this point. So I think cloud, cloud uh, processing or processing of data of, of this volume on the cloud takes a lot of work. 
uh, and it takes a lot of iteration. It took us a while to kind of get to this point where we're able to find the most consistent um, and the most optimized framework. And there's probably still some optimizations to be done, but it does require quite a bit of iteration to kind of get to a point where you finally have a really sustained uh, and working infrastructure that can support you know, processing uh, terabytes of data per day. Um, so we kind of have two forward, we have two data production modes. We have the forward uh, production mode, where essentially as new data comes in from uh, the different satellites, from Landsat 8, Landsat 9, uh, and then Sentinel 2 A and B, uh, we go ahead and generate that data uh, right off the fly. That's forward HOS processing. So essentially from today onward. And so um, our data sources currently are, are gonna be the collection two data that we have from USGS. As of now, we only have Landsat 8 in the L30 product. We plan to incorporate Landsat 9 in the future. Um, <clears throat> S30 right now is for Sentinel 2A and Sentinel 2B. When Sentinel 2C launches, we also plan to include that into uh, the HLS S30 product. Um, the products themselves are on a two to three day latency. So what that means is that if a scene is sensed on March 1st, the data will not become available until March 3rd or March 4th. And the reason is because we're waiting for the ancillary data for the atmospheric correction. So I so showed you the atmospheric correction model that we use to essentially take the top of atmosphere reflectance and generate surface reflectance for both the L30 and S30 products. Uh, the input data that goes in to actually produce that surface reflectance, uh, that actually is uh, typically on a two to three day latency. So whenever that data comes in, we go ahead and generate those data products and then they're surfaced through LPDAC um, typically that same day. For the historical data, uh, we're essentially not necessarily waiting on that, um, that ancillary data for the atmospheric correction anymore. Obviously, all that's been uh, produced. So now we just basically are able to process it as fast as we can. Um, and so right now, we're working on a phased approach to produce this historical archive. We're producing the entire archive of each instrument. So obviously, Sentinel-2B is 2017. Sentinel-2A goes back to 2015. Landsat 8 back to 2013. Um, our data start date uh, for the L30 product, which means the archive will begin for HLS L30 uh, April 11th of 2013. We expect that to complete in April of 2022. So I think right now, if you were to go look at Earth Data Search, you would see that we have data available back to about December of 2015. We expect it to produce those last two years, 2013, I guess those last three years, 13, 14, and 15 over the next couple of weeks and then be available uh, in April of 2022 for the full archive of L30. For S30, the data start date is uh, November 28th of 2015. That coincides with the beginning of the um, operational phase of the Sentinel-2A mission. We're not including any of the data from commissioning phases for any of the instruments. So for Landsat 9, which launched in September of 2021, our start date, I believe, is February 10th, uh, whenever that data went live. We're not including anything from the commissioning phase of any of the instruments within this uh, archive. We expect the full archive to be available for the S30 product uh, in late 2022. So what does that actually mean? So if we look at the, the mean revisit period, I think we talked about that a little bit earlier. Essentially, as you add each instrument, uh, your revisit period over time. So essentially the uh, density of your time series is another way to look at this increases as we add instruments into the uh, constellation. So you can see with Landsat 8, we essentially just had the eight day revisit period. Um, or I guess really we're just having a 16 day revisit period. When we add Sentinel 2A, we go down to a four day revisit period. Uh, Sentinel 2B, uh, or sorry, six day revisit period with Sentinel 2A, Sentinel 2B to four. And then when Landsat 9 comes online, we'll be sub four days uh, with our revisit time uh, globally. And again, that does not, uh, include cloudy scenes. So I think, you know, one of the things that we have within our production system is if a cloud, if a scene is more than 98% cloudy, we essentially discard it because it's going to fail on the uh, atmospheric correction. So we just don't bother with processing those scenes. So you won't always have that same revisit period of four days or less, um, especially in regions with high cloud cover. Um, but, you know, for cloud-free scenes, we can expect a sub four day revisit time once Landsat 9 is integrated into the system. So our current status. So HLS L30 and S30 are both available uh, for uh, stage one release. So those are being distributed by the land processing stack, as I talked about. Uh, those were uh, released on uh, August 24th of 2021. 
Uh, if you go to Earth Data Search, you can just search NASA Earth Data Search and you should be able to find it uh, and then NASA Worldview and be able to find that. Uh, you should be able to find HLS in both of those and I have a demo uh, from those coming up a little bit later. Uh, but that's kind of where we are. This is uh, the Tonga eruption uh, that occurred in December. You can see essentially the island here, uh, then the eruption occurs and then you know, a couple scenes later, there's no island. So that's kind of the resolution that you can expect when you start looking at uh, the HLS products. I think this is something like a 300 by 300 um, pixel GIF that we're kind of looping through there. So our statistics, so our uh, HLS L30 product, like I mentioned, I think we're back through December of 2015. So that means that you can look for data from December of 2015 through present day, and you should be able to have a full time series of that data for HLS L30 within that range, within that time range. Um, that equates to about 5.4 million granules. Uh, we typically have something on the order of about 2,900 granules per day. That is very seasonal, which means that in the summer, we typically have higher, uh, a higher volume uh, of granules and a higher daily volume of data that we produce for HLS L30, just because we have more scenes in the Northern hemisphere um, uh, summer months. Um, and then HLS L30, we have data that goes back to September 29th of 2020. That equates to roughly about 3 million granules. And we have roughly 6,200 granules per day. But again, that is a very seasonal number. Uh, so take these numbers with a bit of a grain of salt. But if you were to download, you know, everything uh, for a given year, that's about what you can expect. So <clears throat> The image here on the right is essentially Mount Kilimanjaro. And I think that one of the things we wanted to talk about before was you know, looking at time series um, using HLS products. Essentially here, we're using both the L30 and S30 products interchangeably. There's a number of different things that you can look for here. You can see the agricultural fields here kind of on the right-hand side. You can see these burn scars that are coming up here on the top right, where essentially fires or new fires are coming in um, associated you know, with either natural wildfires or prescribed burns. Um, you can see that there's a fire here on the side of the mountain. You can watch the retreat of the glacier uh, seasonally to see how that goes. Um, you can see that this is a water reservoir in Tanzania. That's uh, a dam. You can watch the evolution of that by year. And essentially, these are just different applications that you can use for uh, HLS uh, to either look at surface water extent or burn scars and fires. You can look at agricultural monitoring. Um, and this is a really nice way to kind of capture all those different applications in one GIF. Let me see if I can go to the next slide where we talk a bit more about data set characteristics. So uh, generally uh, speaking, everything that we do, we take the, the 10 meter Sentinel 2A and Sentinel 2B data, and we take that back to a 30 meter resolution. So everything is a consistent 30 meter uh, resolution for both HLS L30 and HLS S30, and they are put onto the same grid. As I mentioned, we have a two to four day latency, which basically just means that if we send some data today, you probably won't get it until uh, two or three days later. And that is again, dependent upon the modus data that we use for atmospheric correction. Um, the data format is caught optimized geotiffs. And so what we wanted to do when we were generating the HLS products was be a bit more forward thinking. So I think a lot of people are generally familiar with Google Earth Engine um, and essentially the way that they've structured their uh, platform is essentially to take individual band files so that you can do band math or band combinations pretty much on the fly uh, using the data as it's stored in the cloud. And so we wanted to kind of make that available to our end users through our NASA services as well. So we basically have one data band uh, output as a cloud optimized geotiff. So as I mentioned before, uh, our granule structure, and this is specific to HLS S30, we have the 13 uh, band data files uh, for band one through 12 uh, and eight and eight a uh, for uh, S30. We have our four angle bands, which is our solar zenith angle, solar azimuth angle, viewing zenith angle and viewing azimuth angle, our QA band, uh, a browse image that you can use in earth data search, um, and then our metadata fields uh, that we send out uh, with each granule. That data is also distributed by LPDAT. And so again, looking at the, the GIF on the right-hand side, we're looking at, uh, I think this is Canyon Dam area with the Dixie fire. You can see the advancement of the fire, the burn scars that are left there. You can watch the recovery of the growth uh, from the older burn scar down to the bottom of the image. You can see the advancement of the snowpack uh, through the seasonal uh, change. You can see some of these areas of forest clearing uh, outlined with these brighter snow, uh, snow fields here. 
can watch the sea ice, or sorry, the, the lake ice uh, as it advances. And so again, the time series is really where you're going to make your money with HLS. I mean, I think if you use the, the Landsat products by themselves and the Sentinel products by themselves, you may not get the density of the time series that you may need uh, to kind of look at these land surface uh, features as clearly as you're able to see if you combine and harmonize those products. And that's generally with harmonization of you know, the Landsat Sentinel products in general, I think that's really what we're trying to do here is build out that density of the time series. So I wanted to show this just to kind of outline that this is a coordinated effort, okay? I, I don't necessarily expect you to look at this and, and understand what each group does, but I think what I wanna do is basically make sure that you know that the HLS science team, which is Jeff Massey's team at Goddard, really did a lot of the development of uh, the algorithm themselves. They, did, they sent that off to us so that we could make it and, and put it to the cloud um, and then make it a global product that was distributed you know, through the NASA DAC the DAC and, the, and Gibbs are the ones that are responsible for, you know, distributing that data that we produce so that the data users, which are, I'm assuming most of the people on this call, can actually then come back and do science. And so there's kind of two things that we expect from the data users uh, to make this a successful mission. I think one is to, you know, make and, and do meaningful science from the data that we produce. But then two is to provide feedback. So if there's things that we can improve upon, whether that's, you know, accessibility of the data or uh, tools. Uh, that maybe help access the data or visualize the data. Uh, if there's something that's wrong with the data, you know, the data users are really going to be our, our bread and butter to kind of send that back to make this a really successful mission. And so the, I think probably the most important part of this stakeholder chart is the data users on the back end that really help to make the product uh, as useful as possible. So how do you actually get to the data? I think that's kind of something that, you know, maybe not everybody is familiar with. I go ahead and play this video. This is essentially a demo of the dataset landing page. And I just chose uh, the, the S30 product. Uh, but if you were to go to the, the LP DAC HLS S30 dataset landing page, this is what you would find. Essentially, you can find all the different improvements that we have uh, from the previous version. We had a provisional version that was released um, in 2020. We've updated that to a validated product now. You can find the different um, information about the collection and granule. You can find information about the, the data layers, as I mentioned, or as I showed previously in the presentation, that table is there uh, so that you can reference it. You can find out information about the product quality. Uh, you have a link to the user guide there and then any known issues. And so we've got a couple of known issues there uh, that we've populated. I'm not gonna get into too much detail, but um, you can go and look at the known issues and find out more information there. You can directly access the user guide. So if you wanna get in, in depth uh, with using the data products themselves, you can go hit the user guide. You can look at the ATBD to evaluate the algorithm. Um, LP DAC has put together some nice resources for actually accessing that data natively in the cloud. So you can go click on those uh, resources that LP DAC has provided. You can access that data directly. So Earth Data Search is a really nice link uh, that they produce. Uh, or I guess where you can go and get the data. Um, and so that's a really nice way for you to do that. If you have, you know, you do use the data in one of your papers, we definitely ask that you cite that data in the paper so that we have a general idea of how that data is being used within the community. Um, but that's essentially what you can find at the data set landing page. There's a lot of information that's there. It's really your first step into using either the HLS S30 or the HLS L30 products. The data set landing pages will be pretty similar between the two. Let's see. And this is NASA Worldview. So let me go ahead and show you. Um, and essentially what I'm trying to do is replicate, you know, if you wanted to go look at Mount Kilimanjaro or you want to look at the Dixie Fire and do those plots that I had done before, this is essentially the way that I would do it. I would make myself familiar with the data product on the data set landing pages. I would come to NASA Worldview. I would take a look at uh, the products just to see, um, you know, what the products actually look like. This is really a nice first step into um, visualizing the products as opposed to, you know, diving directly into the data. You can see what all that looks like. And so what you can see is I went in, I selected the different layers. We've got three HLS layers that are in there, the two data layers, the L30 and the S30 product. And then we have a reference grid that you can use. And I'll show you why that's important here in a second. But when we talk about Harmonize, I think this is probably the best way that I can uh, explain this um, to you. If you look at the, the difference between L30 and S30, essentially, as we click them on and off, 
there's no difference between those two products uh, when we click them off um, and we turn off those layers. And so that's really kind of when we talk about harmonization and using them interchangeably, that's what we mean. There should not be that much of a difference or really any difference when we click between the HLS S30 product and the HLS L30 product. Now let's say that you wanted to look at a specific area. The thing that's really nice with the, uh, the HLS grid that's in Worldview is that it'll show you the HLS tile. So uh, everything that I had done in those visualizations previously was using a single HLS tile. Um, so if I go back, let me go back to the end there and I'll pause it. Essentially, <clears throat> what you would wanna do in, in Worldview is find that tile that maybe for that area of interest that you're looking at, and then use that tile ID, this L, or sorry, this 11 SLC, you could put that into um, Earth Data Search and grab all the granules for 11 SLC and then download them and do that same visualization or data analysis. Uh, if you wanted to do NDVI or any kind of uh, land surface monitoring analysis, you could do that essentially by grabbing this uh, NGRS tile ID. And so that's what's really nice about Worldview is that it kind of provides you with, okay, I'm really interested in a particular area. Um, I want to get the tile ID for that specific area. And then you can grab that tile ID using this reference grid and pass that directly into Earth Data Search. So if you're not familiar with Earth Data Search, let me show you what that looks like. <clears throat> this is our primary data access page. And so if I go ahead and hit play, I'll do the search for HLS. You'll see there's three products there. We actually are not responsible for the production of this uh, MUSLI product that's uh, listed here. The two products that you'll be looking for is this HLS. So they'll both have HLS in the front. Uh, you can see the S30 product was there, the L30 product was there. And what you can do is you can also go in and Earth Data Search um, and you can zoom in on a specific area and you can draw an AOI. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the College of James Madison University, but that's where I went for my undergraduate. So I'll use that as an example. Um, and you can draw an AOI and it'll return all the data that intersects that area of interest. We talked about browse imagery earlier. This is what a browse image looks like. It is not a full resolution image, um, but we do basically just show you what that granule will look like. For example, if you want a cloud free scene, you can look pretty quickly at those browse images that are in that thumbnail to see whether or not you're interested in that scene. Um, if you want to go in and you want to download that data, you can go ahead and uh, you know, hit the plus sign, hit the download button. You may be asked to log into your um, uh, Earth Data login account. If you uh, don't have one, you can register, it is free. Uh, you can go ahead and hit download. Um, and then they'll provide you with the links to download the files. So this is with the HTTPS download. Um, you can also do a direct AWS S3 access. They provide you the links uh, to do that. Um, and then they provide a download script that you can use to download. And I believe the download script typically will pull from the HTTPS uh, download server. Um, but again, if you wanted to use the data that's in AWS S3, you can go back to the uh, resources on the data set landing page and they should show you how to use that data directly from the S3 bucket. So to kind of summarize the different applications that we talked about, uh, again, you can look at active fire. So you can see that this is that Canyon land fire that we had shown. This is a freeze frame where you can actually see the, the leading edge of the fire fronts. You can see the smoke plumes uh, and you can see the burn scar to see where it's come, you know, how far it's advanced. If you want to look at snow extent, this is the Himalayas. You can see the snow here is essentially the blue shade. The cloud is in white. Um, you can see how that snow uh, changes as a function of season. Obviously, that's really important for the uh, Western United States. You can look at agricultural fields. This is agricultural uh, fields, I believe, in Egypt. Um, and so again, you can really monitor the evolution of those agricultural fields uh, to see if you know they're getting the water that they need. Obviously, this is a really big irrigation area. Um, so make sure that you know they're not starting to have uh, negative effects on the crops. This is a flooding event from uh, Hurricane Ida. You can look at her, uh, sorry, inland flooding or surface water extent in general. We showed the evolution of that dam uh, at Mount Kilimanjaro. Again, this is just another application of looking at surface water extent um, with HLS products. And then again, you can look at urban monitoring. So I think this is a fairly common one for a lot of the land, uh, Landsat and Sentinel-2 um, visualizations. It's looking kind of at this urban monitoring. Uh, you can do the same thing with HLS as well. So the next steps, I mentioned that we're planning on using uh, the Landsat 9 data, uh, or sorry, integrating the Landsat 9 data into the HLS L30 product. Uh, we expect that to occur in about the April timeframe. 
Um, and then anything from that February 10th date when the data became operational uh, through the date that we actually integrate that Landsat 9 product, we'll go back and reprocess that data. So the data for Landsat 9 will begin uh, in February uh, of 2022. Um, <clears throat> and then we also are gonna have our full archive of the HLS products. So as I mentioned, the L30 product is expected to finish uh, by April of 2022. We're looking for HLS S30 to finish um, at the end of the year. Um, and so I think that's pretty much it. This is essentially the, 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 the Suez Canal when that ship got stuck. These are essentially the ships waiting to come in. So again, that's just giving you another uh, idea of what the resolution actually looks like when you go and look at the HLS imagery at full uh, resolution. So I think that's pretty much it. I don't know if there are any questions in the chat, um, but if not, maybe we can just go to Ferran. Um, thank, thank you, Brian. I think there were a lot of questions, but I think Jeff has answered most of them. Perfect. Um, Thanks, Jeff. I haven't seen the chat at all. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I'm just filling in the, the gaps here. Thanks. Yeah, while we're transitioning to Farhan, maybe if there are any questions that haven't been answered, please uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. I think you can unmute yourself and ask away. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation, Brian. I have a question more like uh, this. Uh, to discuss. So you talked about the harmonization mostly on the uh, radiometric side, but my question is, are you targeting also to do the harmonization on the geometric side? So starting from the raw data, also rectify the images using the same DM and try to correct for any problem with the CCD misalignment with the push broom systems in order to have harmonized also uh, ortho rectified images uh, on the geometric side. So I think the way that we had been talking about this and Jeff, if, uh, you know, if I misspeak here, feel free to jump in. Um, but for the geometric, I think that since we're upscaling everything to 30 meters, I think that we feel like we're within the noise uh, for the geometric harmonization. Um, and so we essentially take the, the native uh, geometric resampling from the S2 products, and we take the geometric resampling from the L30 products, but we, don't, we do not harmonize them, and we do not have plans to do that, uh, just because the, the resampling is within the noise for our 30-meter resolution output product. The, the current, I mean, Farhan can jump in here, too. The, the current geodetic accuracy for Landsat, uh, well, for Sentinel-2 is better than, I think, 8 meters. Um, maybe, maybe better than that now. And for Landsat 8, I think it's on the order of around 10 meters. In fact, we're using, for Landsat, USGS is using the Sentinel-2 global reference image as a base. So they fit together very well already. Now, you mentioned, I think, focal plane, um, you know, band-to-band -band issues. And um, I don't think there's uh, much of an issue there. But, but if you want to expand on that, I can try to answer uh, may, maybe Jeff, I can complement what you mentioned. Um, yeah. the, um, in fact, uh, as, as you said, at 30 meter resolution, we, we are in the noise and, and I think the native accuracies of each sensor is, is uh, enough in order to ensure a good uh, overlap and co-registration between images. Then if we move um, uh, to 10 meters, that would be something else and also maybe worth, I will detail it later in, in my presentation. We have had several activities with NASA and USGS in order to try to harmonize as much as possible also in terms of geometry. So we, we are doing it on each side. So not working together, but uh, cooperating and sharing information and sharing auxiliary data. And for instance, we have shared uh, the ground control point from Sentinel-2, which are used in Landsat uh, processing and also we are considering using uh, in the future the same uh, digital elevation model for both missions. And that would help also in, in, in harmonizing further the geometry of both missions. So at present, the only thing which is implemented in, in Landsat Collection 2 and, and, and Sentinel-2 data is, is this common usage of ground control points where USGS is using this database of ground control points coming from Sentinel to data and that helps uh, to a certain extent to, to align the geometries. 
And then for the future, we have this option of uh, using the same digital television model, but it's not yet uh, in operations. Yeah, thanks, Ferran. I, I think the bottom line for HLS at 30 meters is it's a sub, they, the two data sets overlay each other at subpixel resolution, so it's, it shouldn't be an issue. If you see an issue, let us know. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions before we move on to Ferran? Hi, uh, this is Shubun Wang from ARA. So can I have one question about the BRDF uh, correction? So uh, I'm, I'm interested in the algorithm and the parameters. So uh, used in this harmonization. Thank you. So we use, um, it's, a, it's a very simple uh, algorithm. It was published by David Roy and Crystal Schaff in 2016, I think, which is um, a simple set of coefficients per band uh, that doesn't depend on land cover type. Um, and the, the, the basic idea is that because we're looking at a pretty narrow range of view angles here, right? Seven, seven and a half degrees for, uh, for Landsat and uh, 10 and a half degrees for Sentinel-2, that the BRDF shape is pretty linear in that, in that restricted view angle range. Um, and so you can just get by with a, a very simple linear correction. Um, that may break down in some cases like ice and, and uh, maybe certain types of soil, but, um, but that's where we are right now. The um, one thing to note is we don't do a solar angle correction. So at first in the early versions of the HLS product, we tried to do a solar angle correction too. So you were basically looking at like the equivalent sort of same time of year at all points in the, in the year. Um, and that didn't work well at all. So we, we ended up not doing that. And so we do a view angle correction only. So basically you think of it as nature adjusted products is what HLS is. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you, uh, everyone. I think in the interest of time, let's move on to Farhan's presentation. And we have, uh, I think we'll have plenty of time after Farhan to discuss some of these questions. Go ahead, Farhan. Thank you, Manil. Thank you very much for, for the invitation and to share with you um, the the, the status of this uh, center like project and, and the activities we are doing in harmonization and fusion in terms of harmonization and fusion between Sentinel-2 and, and Landsat. So I'll try to share PowerPoint. Oh, now I realize I need to change the setting of my computer. I hope I, hope I will not have to reboot. Uh, so Manila, I realize I have to reopen Zoom, so I have to disconnect and reconnect. That's fine. We'll come we'll, we'll, back in a second. Yeah, that's that's fine. In the meantime, if there are any other questions, please ask Brian or Jeff. I'll just mention. I think uh, maybe he's on, but Zheng Chang Zhu with uh, University of Maryland. I think might be on, but he gets a lot of credit on the HLS side for doing a lot of the technical work and a lot of the QA and validation work as well. So um, just wanted to give some recognition to Jung Chang. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. And actually, I'll bring up a point too. I think Jun Chang wrote uh, essentially a really nice download script that you can go and search for a specific scene. Uh, like uh, I had showed you the MGRS tile. Um, you can filter by cloud coverage and you can essentially download all of the data uh, for that specific scene given that cloud coverage. And so that is uh, published at the LP DAC uh, on the LP DAC dataset landing pages. Um, and so that should be a really nice entrance point uh, for you to get into HLS if you haven't already. Thank you. Farhan, we can see your screen now. Great, thank you, Manil. So I'll put full screen mode. Should be fine now. Can you see? Yeah. Great. So hello again, everyone. Um, yeah, go to the first slide. 
So thanks, thanks again for, for the invitation uh, to give us this opportunity to present you uh, all the activities we are doing on, on Copernicus site and on ESA site regarding the harmonization and fusion of uh, uh, Sentinel-2 and Landsat uh, data. Uh, so I will give this a short presentation uh, on behalf of the Send to Light project team. So it's, it's, a, it's a large team of people, and uh, one of them in particular is, is present here in the audience, is Sébastien Saunier, that also might jump in in the discussion in case there are any detailed questions that are beyond my, my knowledge. Um, so then also I would like to thank Brian for the excellent presentation that uh, he provided just before, and it, it will help a lot uh, in understanding uh, this one, which uh, it's, uh, it's uh, sometimes not going so much in, in, in the details, and so the, the previous presentation would be really helpful. So first of all, just a quick reminder of uh, Sentinel-2 uh, mission, what's the Copernicus Sentinel-2 mission. It's an optical multispectral mission, as introduced by Brian before. It's a constellation of two satellites, and we provide free and open products uh, for feeding a large range of applications. And here on the bottom, there is the same, the very same figure uh, from USGS that uh, Brian showed, um, illustrating uh, how the Sentinel-2 bands where are located Sentinel-2 bands in gray on the top compared to Landsat 7 and 8 uh, on, the, on the bottom. And then Landsat 9 would be equivalent to Landsat 8 here in this graph. So just uh, as Brian also explained, there is a similarity between certain couples of those bands. And those are the ones that we are trying to harmonize in the framework of this, uh, of this activity. Regarding Sentinel-2 uh, products, uh, this slide, this table summarizes which are all the products that the mission is generating, or at least all the products that ESA is generating, the European Space Agency on, uh, on behalf of the European Commission for, for the Copernicus program. Because there are, I, I say that because there are other products generated downstream, but that's in the framework of the Copernicus uh, services. So ESA is generating for Sentinel-2 uh, two main core products, the level 1C, the so-called level 1C and the level 2A. The level 1C being top of atmosphere reflectances in cartographic geometry and the level 2A being surface reflectances in cartographic geometry. So these are the two uh, um, uh, public products that uh, the mission is generating, that ESA is generating and distributing to, to all users. On top of that, the, there is well a level 1B, which is a product in sensor geometry that we are only uh, distributing, generating over a, a limited area and distributing to a restricted number of users. And then we have what we call a set of uh, pilot products, uh, which are products which are not operationally generated, systematically generated. These products are uh, only generated for the time being in limited productions. Uh, for demonstration purposes, and if they these products become successful, they might one day become uh, core products and join the level one C and level two A products as as broad public uh, products. So the at the moment we have two pilot products, the level two H and the level two F, which are uh, the scope of this presentation. The level two H being the the so called harmonized uh, the harmonized Landsat eight Sentinel two surface reflectance product and level 12, the fused Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2 surface reflectance product. And I will explain later what's the difference between harmonized and fused product uh, so that you can understand the, the, the change between the, the differences between the two. Uh, before proceeding also, I would like to, to provide a, a quick overview of uh, all the activities we are performing together with USGS and NASA for improving the interoperability between Sentinel-2 and, uh, and Landsat mission. Uh, as, uh, so this was uh, anticipated before, uh, answering the question from, from, from Saif. Uh, it's, um, uh, we are performing uh, activities at different levels in terms of geometry, in terms of radiometry, in terms of surface reflected radiometry, in terms of cloud masking, and in terms of harmonizing and fusing uh, uh, products as uh, the last ballot. So in terms of geometry, we have the, the common usage of Sentinel-2 GRI, Global Reference Image. As I said before, the GRI is being used uh, as a source of ground control points 
for uh, collection two uh, over the areas where USGS had no uh, not enough uh, ground control points. Um, then also we are in discussions for using uh, Copernicus Dam as a, as a common uh, digital television model for uh, both missions. So this is, as, as I said, this is not something which is currently in operations, but is an, uh, uh, a potential uh, improvement of interoperability that's, that's on the table. Uh, then we have the DIMIX, uh, the CO's DIMIX exercise, uh, where we compare uh, the dig different digital television models, and we try to see the differences between them and better understand these, understanding these differences. We can uh, uh, better correct uh, each one of them. And finally, also we have activities in terms of uh, uh, more R&D activities in terms of uh, finding new uh, grid systems uh, for, for improving interoperability, not only between Sentinel-2 and Landsat, but also uh, thinking about uh, uh, having a grid, a common grid that allows to integrate any kind of mission, even at lower spatial resolution. In terms of radiometry, uh, so we had uh, pre-launch an intercomparison between uh, uh, Landsat and Sentinel-2, uh, which allowed us to see that we are, we're not too far in terms of uh, radiometry. Uh, Sentinel-2 also worth to note uh, is uh, uh, to a certain extent inspired on Landsat 8 bands. So that has uh, helped greatly in terms of facilitating the, the interoperability of the two missions, having bands which were already uh, 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 put close together, that has helped uh, a lot in terms of facilitating interoperability. Then also in terms of absolute radiometry intercomparison, we have ongoing activities. There are several publications, uh, uh, joint publications with NASA and USGS, uh, where we compare the radiometry of the two sensors and in order to understand the differences as shown in here in the bottom right uh, figure. Um, then also uh, in terms of surface reflectance, the level 2A product and cloud masking, we have CO's activities, the Committee on Earth Observation activities, uh, for intercomparing our atmospheric corrections so we can understand the differences. Um, also intercomparing, comparing the cloud mask between the, uh, which is used on both sides of the Atlantic. And uh, finally also in CO's we have an activity in terms of uh, uh, defining a specification for analysis ready data, uh, which also uh, helps in, in towards uh, uh, facilitating interoperability between the two missions. And last but not least, we have this uh, generation of uh, harmonized and fused products uh, uh, where Stentolite project has been cooperating with the HLS project on, on NASA site. So this, this, this was just a quick overview of all the activities without going in too much into detail, but uh, for uh, some of you that might be interesting to, to get uh, this, this overall overview. Um, in terms of context for, for the Sentulike like project, um, it's uh, what, what we realized in the, in the last, uh, maybe it was five, six years ago, is that there was a growing need for several applications uh, of having analysis ready data, so data which is easy to use, which uh, non expert users can take and, and uh, quickly uh, start exploiting. Uh, having analysis ready data providing surface reflectance measurements with a higher temporal uh, frequency. And this need uh, came at the moment where we had several optical missions which were flying together and a growing number of, uh, of plan to be launched uh, missions in the coming years. So then it, uh, that uh, also uh, looking at what was done on NASA site uh, uh, on, on the HLS project that uh, clearly inspired us in, in having, uh, we, we saw the potential of all these missions together uh, and, and we saw the strong potential uh, to combine all these missions in a single and coherent data stream providing consistent surface reflected measurements with a higher uh, revisit frequency. So the, the goal uh, from that, uh, the Sentinel-like uh, project was born and the goal uh, is to provide Sentinel-2-like surface reflectance as with higher uh, frequency. So just in short, the difference between the HLS project and the Sentinel-like project is, uh, I, I would say one sentence that HLS brings Sentinel-2 to Landsat uh, characteristics, 
Well, Sentolite project brings uh, Landsat to Sentinel-2 characteristics. So we bring Landsat to a 10 meter special resolution. Um, and, and also we bring Landsat to the spectral bands of Sentinel-2. Uh, surface reflectance will be generated through an harmonization and fusion, I would add, uh, process combining data from, uh, from different optical sensors. And the first step, which is, was the, the first target of this uh, Sentolite project, was to combine Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8 and 9. Uh, also, as I said before, as the first step, we generate a demonstration production only. So we are less advanced than the HLS project. We are not yet in, a, in, a, in an operational production scheme where we generate globally uh, all the tiles and we distribute to users. Uh, but for the time being, we are just at the stage of, uh, um, of generating demonstration productions, which are being evaluated by users, by key users. And if successful, if users find these uh, products uh, uh, useful for them, then uh, we, will, we might go move forward to the next step, which is an operational production. Um, this slide summarizes uh, the how uh, uh, level 2F and level 2H products are generated. So we start having input uh, Landsat uh, Sentinel-2 data and Landsat 8 and 9 uh, data. The first step is the stitching of the, of the data between the two missions in terms of uh, geometry. Uh, so that allows to go to sub-pixel accuracy and to have a, a very precise matching between the, the two uh, missions. So that was necessary in this case, because at the end we will have products at 10 meters. So the geometry, when, when you're looking at, uh, at pixels at 10 meters and you want to have temporal series at pixel level, uh, 10 meter resolution, you need a very precise uh, geometrical co-registration between different, between images acquired at different points in time. Uh, so then there is a geometric processing, which includes quality control. There is a cloud masking, uh, allowing to uh, exclude uh, cloudy pixels. Uh, then there is an atmospheric correction, which uses the same scheme for both uh, missions. There is a BRDF adjustment. And finally, uh, a spectral adjustment, which uh, uh, brings uh, sp uh, Landsat spectral bands, uh, transform Landsat spectral bands to something uh, like Sentinel-2 spectral bands. Uh, at this stage, what we have, and that's the, the orange line that you have here, is an harmonized product. Uh, so we have a Landsat product, which looks like a Sentinel-2 uh, product for the common bands. Uh, and that's uh, what we call the level 2H product. Then there is a, an additional step, which is a, a fusion step, uh, where we, we bring uh, the Landsat uh, data to, um, to, to 10 meter resolution. And for that, this fusion step uses in input uh, both, data, both Sentinel-2 and Landsat data and uses the high frequencies of Sentinel-2 in order to increase the spatial resolution of, uh, of Landsat. And that's the so-called level 2F, F for fused product. Uh, then worth to mention, well, Sentolike is the processor generating these two uh, products. And this uh, processor is uh, available in open source at, uh, at this uh, website. So any of you that would like uh, to, to generate uh, your own production uh, for test purposes, or for evaluation purposes, or for whatever, uh, just to let you know that the, the processor is, is available uh, as open source. Uh, this slides uh, illustrates uh, um, how these level 2F uh, fuse products look like. So this is a temporal series uh, combining Sentinel-2A, Sentinel-2B, and Landsat-8. Um, so it, that's an agricultural site in the US, and you see here the red uh, rectangle, uh, the, the area that it has been measured and displayed in this uh, time series here. Uh, this is an example of the level 2F H uh, image. So that's uh, a Landsat 8 image, a 30 meter resolution where uh, the, the radiometry has been, has been brought to Sentinel-2 uh, equivalent radiometry. And here you have the equivalent uh, uh, level 2F fuse product over the same area. So it's going from the 30 meters of the level 2H product to the 10 meters of the level 2F uh, product where we use the, as I said before, the high frequencies from Sentinel-2 
in order to increase the spatial resolution of uh, Landsat. And so, and we use the, the closest Sentinel-2 cloud-free image in order to increase the, the, the resolution. Uh, in terms of processing steps or, or algorithms, uh, this table uh, and the following in the next slide to summarize which are the algorithms uh, that, that have been used. For atmospheric correction, there are two options, send to core, which is the, the main option, which uh, send to core has been adapted to correct also Landsat 8 and 9, and it's used for both uh, satellites. And then we also have SMAC, which is a simplified uh, algorithm which uh, runs faster and sometimes is also useful for uh, for uh, testing purposes and not only also for 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 users uh, uh, not requiring a, an accurate atmospheric correction. Um, uh, regarding uh, geometric processing, as, as mentioned before, there is a stitching, geometric quality control checks, geometric correction, and refraining to the the grid, uh, the, the the grid that's that's the same grid that uh, Brian presented before. Uh, it's a Sentinel-2 grid, which is used uh, for, uh, for, for providing the data, for framing the products and providing them to users. Um, we have a target uh, accuracy of uh, co-registration uh, of 0 0.3 pixel to sigma registration. So that's uh, allowed by this teaching process. There is a co-registration algorithm which refines the geometry of, of, the, of the sensors and brings all the images to a, to a common geometry with this accuracy. Uh, regarding BRDF adjustment, there are these two algorithms which are implemented, the C-factor approach and the scene-dependent uh, HR-BRDF approach from Bermot, Justice, and, and Rayon. And the first one is the Roy, uh, with Roy approach. Regarding bandpass adjustment, we use the very same uh, we use the, the very the very same HLS uh, NASA coefficients, um, and we use the adaptive correction based on a spectral SBAF uh, database. Uh, well, is, this is not uh, this is being investigated and not used yet uh, at the moment. Then regarding fusion, we, we use an in-house developed method. So a uh, method developed by Telespatio France, uh, the, the contractor in charge of developing uh, Centulike. Uh, and then for the validity mass production, uh, we, we use the level 1C and level 2A Sentinel to products quality mask in order to, uh, and, the, and the sync classification from level 2A uh, if available. So this slide just illustrates uh, the, I've taken one of the processing steps, that's the bandpass adjustment, uh, where you can see the differences between the spectral responses of the, of the, of the common bands between Lancet and Sentinel-2. Uh, so as mentioned before, they are uh, relatively uh, similar and that has facilitated a lot uh, the, the harmonization of the two missions. Uh, in terms of validation, um, there has been a, a huge effort which has been performed during the last year by the Send to Light team in order to validate time series and the impact of each uh, processing step uh, on the quality of the time series has been assessed using a, a, an index, a, a time series smoothness indicator, which allows to see the, the coherence of the, of the dots of the samples provided by each one of the, of the satellites. Also worth to mention that uh, sent to like also harmonizes between Sentinel-2A and Sentinel-2B to a certain extent. So these two missions, they are uh, not uh, fully harmonized in terms of, uh, of radiometry and, and uh, absolute radiometry. And there is also correction bringing uh, Sentinel 2B to Sentinel 2A reference uh, radiometry, and that's that's the case today. Maybe in the future will be less necessary in collection one. In Sentinel 2 collection one, we are planning to harmonize the radiometry between the two missions, uh, bringing Sentinel 2B radiometries to uh, Sentinel 2A. And maybe the, this step will not be necessary anymore. Um, then also worth mentioning that there is a demonstration production over Belgium, which has been generated. So uh, we selected Belgium being a relatively cloudy country, so more challenging in order to, uh, for, for optical data users to get cloud-free data. So having more missions, uh, uh, taking images there, that, that, uh, uh, that, that would help. And so that was a nice case for illustrating the, the benefit of having uh, harmonizing several sensors in order to have more cloud-free samples over a certain area. 
Um, so the processing of, uh, so there were 10 Belgium tiles uh, for the years 19 and 20, the full years that were generated using the BRDF ROI uh, correction method. Uh, production is currently under evaluation by the, the Copernicus services, which are a set of services in the framework of the Copernicus uh, European Union program, uh, which uh, develop, uh, which, which use Sentinel's data in order to uh, generate downstream uh, products for for uh, for users. Uh, so the, these Copernicus services are currently evaluating the, this pilot production, and we will have the feedback their feedback soon. Uh, and if the products are as uh, useful for them and uh, and of having a and having a good quality, um, send this level two H and level two F products will be proposed for operational on demand uh, production. So just uh, the last slide, uh, some conclusions. So sent to like uh, pilot processor and generate the level 2H and level 2F have reached uh, a good level of maturity at this moment. So we are glad about uh, the level of maturity reach and the processor as mentioned before has been published uh, as open source uh, in GitHub. Uh, extensive validation work uh, was performed during the last year by the team. A large production demonstrator uh, was completed over Belgium and currently under evaluation. There are still some R&D work related to the integration, integration of new missions, of uh, additional missions in Central Light, which is uh, ongoing. But otherwise, uh, regarding the algorithms, we do not plan to have a major evolutions in the short terms regarding the algorithms. So we, we consider the, the algorithms the algorithmic baseline is pretty stable and, and uh, we're, we're for the time being uh, happy with it. Uh, and finally, to mention that there is a paper under preparation for, um, for a special issue that uh, will uh, be released in June this year. So that paper will provide further details uh, to the community on, 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 on the algorithm and, and sent to like in general. Uh, also to mention that on the GitHub website that I provided before, you can also find um, all the documentation regarding a Central Light project. So there you can have any kind of details you wish on, on, the, on, the, on the processor and on the product generated. And with that, I think I've completed the, the presentation. So thanks a lot. And I have not looked at the chat if there are any questions. I'm glad to answer them in real time. Thanks, Farhan. Uh, just for everyone, I'm Rahul Ramachandran. Manul had to step out to another meeting, so I'm taking over the moderation duties from him. So uh, thank you again, Farhan, for the really nice presentation here. There are a few questions. I think some of you may have already answered, but I'll still go through them. Um, so I think uh, one of the questions is, who can ask for the level 2H and level 2F, uh, and how long does it take to get the authority? I guess it's more of an access question to the data products. Yeah, I there is no generic rule, but I would uh, ask any anyone interested uh, to have access to to this product for evaluation purposes can contact me. And uh, up to now, it's a limited community, so I've been able to manage. If there is <laughs> a huge interest, then uh, we might change, <laughs> we might handle it otherwise. But for the time being. Uh, you can contact me and and, uh, and and have a discussion on that. There is no generic procedure or process for or policy for for accessing the data. Um, the the other question is: Can one clone the repo and operationalize ourselves? I guess you have the code on GitHub. Is, uh, assuming it's open for them to use, is that? Correct. Yeah, the the processor in open source can be freely used, so it's available on on GitHub, and uh, uh, any anyone can download it and uh, uh, compile it on their platforms and and use it. Yeah. So I think there are lots of questions about the video and the PowerPoint presentations. I am assuming that IEEE will make the video and the slides available after the the webinar is over. Um. There's a question uh, regarding the difference. What is the difference between fusion product and pan sharpening product? 
Yes, uh, well, pen, pen sharpening uh, by, by definition uses the panchromatic band. Uh, in this case, we, we do not use the panchromatic band, but we use the, well, the, the 10 meter resolution band. But the, the process is similar of uh, what would be a pen sharpening. Then there are many a lot of methods that can be used. But the, the principle is uh, similar to the one of the pen sharpening. You to take the the high frequencies uh, from from the the higher spe uh, special resolution sensor, and you use them in order to increase the the special resolution of the lower resolution sensor. Thanks, Ron. So I think uh, maybe I'll pause on the uh, the audience questions now, and we can go to the panel part of the webinar. Uh, and Brian and Jeff turn their cameras on, and then I have some questions. And hopefully, um, you know, the audience can also jump in with those questions. So I'll start with, uh, you know, maybe a you know, more of an overarching question about data harmonization. I think we've seen the potential of, you know, what it can do. Do you all think that this could be extended to other optical data sets? to help with uh, downstream applications, especially like commercial data sets that are, uh, who, that are available. Maybe I'll start, Jeff, I'll start with you. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I would think so. I do think that, um, for example, a number of the commercial companies, um, I see Ignacio is online. I know he used to work with uh, Planet, for example have used uh, Landsat and Sentinel as reference data for radiometric uh, calibration and harmonization across, uh, you know, across, for example, planets internal uh, archives. And so, yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity for harmonizing across the government and commercial systems and using the government systems as a type of um, baseline reference. Um, in terms of, of other you know, applications, I, I think we always have a question in, in harmonization as to what level do you harmonize? Do you harmonize at the, at the radiometric level? Do you harmonize at the surface reflectance level? Do you harmonize at higher level products like land cover or vegetation greenness or something like that? So there's a lot of, um, a lot of work to be done in terms of harmonization at, that, at those higher levels also, um, which is interesting. We haven't pursued that, at least in the HLS activity too much. Thanks, Jeff. Farhan or Brian, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, fully in line with what Jeff said, I think there is clearly uh, an interest in extending the number of missions that we are harmonizing and fusing. Uh, we, we do plan to extend inside ESA to other ESA missions. So we have uh, CHIME and LSTM missions uh, in the pipeline, which also would be harmonized uh, and, and fused with Sentinel-2. Uh, and also we have planned in order to extend, I'm just talking about public uh, missions, so uh, not yet commercial. Uh, also, we have plans to extend the harmonization process uh, between uh, ESA missions or European missions, uh, hyperspectral missions and, and, and thermal missions with equivalent uh, US missions. So I'm thinking about SBG for, the, for instance, and also harmonizing with other European missions in case of hyperspectral instruments, that could be NMAP, for instance, and in case of thermal emissions, uh, Trisna emissions from, from CNES and, and ISRO. So that's, uh, I, I would say from, from our point of view, what's the main priority is uh, harmonizing missions which are, uh, free, uh, which are available free, freely and openly. Uh, so when it comes to uh, uh, commercial missions, there is definitely an interest, but maybe it's more on commercial side. We, we can leave that to on commercial side. And that's the purpose. That was also the goal of providing the processor as open source, uh, facilitating the, the exploitation of these algorithms on commercial side uh, for, uh, for integrating their missions in, in the pipelines. Yeah, I think, Ferran, you kind of touched on what I was thinking too. Like, I think not only with harmonization, but data fusion. So I think when I say data fusion, I think of, you know, maybe instruments that aren't necessarily both optical, but you maybe have, you know, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 combined, you know, with maybe a Landsat-8 product or something like that. Um, 
and then you know generating a single output data product. I think there's opportunities for us to merge data from all these different satellites, whether it be fully harmonization or if it's data fusion, um, where you know everybody's trying to reach a common goal to understand you know some application, either it be land surface monitoring or maybe surface water extent or you know whatever the case might be, whatever the application may be, where you know, starting to leverage technologies like harmonization and data fusion, I think are really going to be useful for advancing the science uh, moving forward. And I think that requires both, you know, interagency collaboration like we have here with NASA and DESA and obviously USGS, but then also extending that out to the commercial sector. Um, because I think that, you know, having everybody on the same page as you kind of start to advance the science a little bit, I think is really going to make it better as we get, you know, 20, 30 years down the line. Yeah, I think Fran's point of, you know, making the processor code available really resonates, right? Both ESA and NASA is moving to a, towards this whole notion of open science and enabling others to step in. Uh, I think that's a, that's a great point, yeah. Um, so maybe the next question may be more on the data system side, I guess, which I know a little bit more about than the science itself. Uh, I think both ESA and NASA are pretty committed to using cloud for data production and distribution. Um, I think, are there any lessons learned in terms of, you know, future cloud-based cloud production, you know, that were gleaned from, you know, the HLS production or the Centu-like, uh, you know, uh, prototyping efforts? Yeah, I guess I can start us off on that one. I think, you know, for our cloud-based uh, data production system, I think one of the things that we've really had to work on was there's so many different knobs to tune uh, when it comes to a cloud-based data production system. Um, you know, I mean, even getting into, uh, you know, the types of instances that you use, uh, whether or not they're on demand or you know, spot, all of those things then can affect your cost, which then, uh, you know, comes into this situation of, you know, whether or not you can produce the full archive or just have a rolling archive. Uh, all those things have to be considered um, and so I think one of the lessons learned that, you know, from the HLS data production system is to take your time finding that sweet spot where, you know, you're not necessarily working yourself into uh, the ground where you're not making any progress at all, but you should also take the time uh, as you're starting to develop these data systems to make sure that you're really getting to a point where you can provide the best um, experience to the user. So for example, if you give HLS data to uh, the end user, but it's you know maybe at a 90-day rolling archive, that's not really that useful. But if you were able to kind of find a way within your budget to kind of tune the knobs of the cloud-based computing system so that you can provide that full archive, then all of a sudden that becomes a much more useful product. And so those considerations I think are really, uh, really important as you start to develop the data production system. Saran, do you want to add anything on the ESA side? Yeah, I mean, on either side, as, as I said, we are still in a, a kind of pr a prototyping or pilot production stage. But we, in parallel of that, we have the full migration of the ground segments to the cloud. So re regarding the cloud, we are really excited of, of how it's going, this, this uh, migration of, of the ground segment to, to the cloud. Uh, I, th I think we were starting to see the benefits, the flexibility, the... Of, of having every all the infrastructure uh, brought to the cloud uh, compared to to, to past setup uh, the, the previous setup where it was much more rigid. Um, so also this this um, uh, this uh, transition this transformation of the ground segment uh, bringing it to the cloud allows us to have more uh, flexibility for adding. Uh, uh, new products in in the production chain, and that's uh, exactly what uh, these uh, harmonized and fused products uh, can benefit from. Uh, if they if they demonstrate uh, if there is a an interest from users uh, from the Copernicus services in moving forward in that direction, we we have an infrastructure which is able to grow in order to to support the production of uh, of, of of these new products. So that's. Really exciting times. Uh, all this transformation of, of the of the ground segment technologies allows uh, much more flexibility and 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 in, in the production of new products. Thanks, Brian. So, Brian, uh, there was a comment in the chat. Apologies. Uh, that uh, 
you know, you had mentioned the Sentinel-2 data is not available on AWS, and Nikos put a comment on that in the chat that Sentinel-2 data is indeed available on S3 bucket through their open data program. Do you want to make a comment on that and why SLS production did not use it? Yeah, sure. So I guess I'll be a bit more clear there. I think one of the things that, you know, as an official NASA product that we have to maintain is, you know, using authoritative data sources. Um, and so when I say that the Sentinel-2 data is not available on AWS, it's not managed by ESA. Um, and so the data that we get for uh, the HLS data products are uh, directly provided by ESA so that we can you know, tie them back to an authoritative data source. And so I guess that's the point of clarification I guess I should make on that. Because I know that the data is available, uh, Sentinel-2 data is available also on Google Earth Engine or, or Google Cloud. Um, and, you know, we did not use that data either. I think, you know, for, for the HLS products, we're using authoritative data directly from ESA. Thanks, Brian. Um, I think well, there's one uh, specific uh, question for you, Farhan. Uh, what method do the uh, L2F products use to achieve super resolution uh, of, or from resolution of 30 to 10? Yeah, maybe if the if the question asks wants more details, I don't know if Sebastian Sonier is still connected and might complement what I mentioned before at high level. Yeah, I think he's trying to address it in the chat, so I'll let him uh, the information. I see. Yeah, Sebastian, we still cannot hear you. Hello, everybody. Do you hear me? Yes, Sebastian. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Hello, everybody. Yeah, so I was uh, there is a question, Sebastian, on on how the 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 fusion algorithm works in terms of radiometry, how you go from the 30 meters to the 10 meter special mm -hmm. resolution. Alors, all, all this information is quite well explained in the software user manual available on GitHub, huh? but uh, I, can, I, I can recall if you want. The, the, we start at the beginning to test uh, with a star FM process. So it's, it's well uh, acknowledged in the community. But uh, finally, we, we, it was not totally um, uh, compliant with uh, what we, we expect in the way that with Sentinel-2, we already have uh, the higher spatial resolution, so the 10 meter uh, from temporal point of view. And, uh, and we have also uh, the higher temporal revisit with Sentinel-2. So we, we decided to, to keep the, the low frequency of Landsat at a given date, so the, the 30 meter low, low spatial frequency of Landsat, and uh, to, to, to predict the high frequency content uh, with uh, Sentinel-2. And uh, at, at the time of, uh, of, of the fusion, at the time of at the observation date of the Landsat data. And uh, by doing this, we, we compose uh, the two image, so the high frequency content predicted with uh, Sentinel-2 and uh, the low frequency content uh, given by Landsat at, uh, at the observation date. Voilà. So it is, a, it is a combination of, uh, of these two, uh, two approaches. Um, voilà. So it is, a, it is really a matter of uh, filtering and a matter of, uh, of separating, of splitting uh, between uh, high frequency and low frequency content. Which is really simple because the problem is that we were uh, also in an operational, uh, not operational context, but we want to produce quite, uh, quite fast. So we want to limit as much as possible uh, inversion. And, uh, and finally it works well and it is a, uh, the results are very good. Huh? We, we validate uh, with a lot of sites and uh, it seems to be uh, quite efficient. And the assumption is that we have a very good uh, geometry accuracy, very good registration, 
and we are able to use the temporal information. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Sebastian. I think is is the sum the user manual? I think that's one of the questions. Yeah, because in, in the sum I've tried to summarize the theory behind. Because we try to, to fix uh, your, an error budget also to these methods and uh, to alert. Uh, we are not sure to have uh, the perfect value, the perfect physical measurement at the given date, date huh, for sure. So it, it was important to, 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 to associate uh, an error. So voila, it is explained in the same. Huh? And, um, and again, we. We work a lot uh, on, uh, I think I published this, we work a lot uh, trying to, 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 to see if uh, the preserve, how the edge, you know, transition sharpness is preserved uh, with the Landsat 10 meter and we make comparison with Sentinel-2 and uh, really the comparison as a result are, are very good. And um, so we were happy with this. So I will not say that it is excellent, but uh, it seems to be a good product from visual point of view and uh, first uh, quantitative analysis. Thank you, Sebastian. Voilà. I'll go back to the panel. There's an interesting question by Ignacio asking, could government and companies collaborate on developing the specification slash standard so there can be multiple implementations of fusion harmonization. What I what, what I wanted to tell you, sorry, huh? you in the community we we see a lot of fusion algorithm from private company from in, in in the space domain. But the problem is that and pan sharpening. And the problem is that for most of this application, the the physical measurement is not preserved. So you have very beautiful images, but without a physical measurement. And uh, in the fusion, we do, we did, we make a lot of tests to be sure that we preserve the physical quantities. So it is a major difference between, and maybe it reply uh, somehow to the question huh, of Inatio, but uh, it was a major requirement for us. It was to, to be able to preserve this, this uh, physical uh, information. Voilà. Jeff, do you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what Sebastian said that uh, I mean, thinking about the question about government and, and commercial companies working together to provide specifications. I, so, I mean, some of that is happening. You know, there is the CIOS analysis ready data kind of uh, card for L specification that's been done. I'm not sure that was collaborative with, with industry necessarily, um, but uh, I'm not sure it's so much a matter of specification as it is benchmarking. Um, things like the AKIX experiments, right, where you run multiple atmospheric correction approaches in controlled environments and look at the strengths and weaknesses of each is a valuable kind of tool to, to do in this context, right? And you could imagine doing that with multiple harmonization approaches. But again, part of the key, I think, is what Sebastian said, which is, you know, at some point there has to be some truth. And that usually involves a physical measurement on the ground that you can, you can verify. Um, so, so that's where we sometimes get into, into some difficulty, not so much on the harmonization side, but on the fusion side, um, you know, uh, making sure that actually there is a truth to, to, uh, to benchmark against. So I'll uh, ask a naive question wearing my data science hat. Can uh, any of these machine learning AI algorithms be used to help with the harmonization aspect? from one sensor to the other? Or has that work been done? Yeah, I think in principle, sure. Um, some of that work probably has been done. I, other people may, may know about it. Um, I, I think actually that was part of the, the, the uh, Sentinel-2F uh, kind of effort. Um, but that's another approach is to, instead of, you know, doing the, the physics based corrections at each step, you could also think about an AI based approach. Yeah, I think I have seen a little bit of that work that's already started uh, on that. I think it comes back to the point that you made with the commercial um, 
collaborations is that, you know, I think the only thing with machine learning that you always hear is, you know, tying it back to physical, you know, physical processes and physical uh, values. And so as long as that, uh, the output from those models can be, you know, compared and then validated on a certain, on a set of ground truth or reference data, um, you know, I think that you know, the potential is certainly there. I think it's just a matter of, you know, everyone kind of getting on board with, you know, that implementation and then again, getting those collaborations in place because it is going to be a collaborative effort to kind of transition in, into that space, I think. This, this goes back to an earlier question that was in the chat, which is, you know, could you do this with worldview? Um, so, you know, trying to mix a 30 centimeter, very occasional image with a 30, 10 or 30 meter uh, moderate resolution image, I think. To my mind, that starts to get into some some very difficult challenges. I mean, you could do it with AI and super resolution, and, and people do that. But is what's actually represented on the ground in those intermediate synthesized images actually real? Can you depend on that if you needed information at 30 centimeters? I don't know. It's an interesting question. But... So I'm going to open uh, the panel up for questions from the audience. If uh, people have uh, questions, uh, you can raise your hand or ask your question directly. I can I can say that um, the machine learning is, um, if I permit, huh, uh, machine learning is a really a very good field of uh, of research for uh, for our purposes, and uh, I would see more machine learning for uh, for the different part of the system, not harmonization as a whole, but uh, for harmonization of the calibration of the spectral information, harmonization maybe in fusion, maybe you know at different steps of the processing. And in this way, we'll be able to, to see the real efficiency. The idea of send to like and probably also HLS is to really to have independent block and to, to apply a different processing also and to see uh, if how we can improve each processing and finally improve the overall error budget. So if you can uh, change, improve a spectral, uh, spectral uh, correction, if you, BRDF correction, uh, geometric correction, you will, you will always see the direct impact on, uh, on the spatiotemporal facet stability. And finally, it, it, it is uh, the final objectives is to, to, to get the more consistent uh, spatiotemporal facet. So machine learning is really interesting to, to introduce uh, very quickly a new mission. And um, because it, it is really, uh, you know, it, uh, it is very time consuming to, to, to introduce a new mission. There is a lot of uh, things to, to analyze and um, probably with much learning in the next year, next time, we'll be able to, to include. A so in quality. your uh, centralized <laughs> flow, do you use any machine learning algorithms? And if yes, which specific algorithms are you trying? Today, we are not using machine learning, but it is not excluded to use it for, for certain parts of the processing. Okay. Yeah, we, we have several R&D activities in ESA for, uh, related to machine learning for, uh, for the, the increase, to increase the resolution of Sentinel-2 data, for instance, or this type of applications, but this is not yet uh, transferred to, to Sentinel-like. But I, I fully agree with what Sebastian said. There is potential there uh, for each one of these steps, including atmospheric corrections, maybe. There mm. are also R&D activities there in order to accelerate uh, uh, all these different steps and uh, without losing in terms of, uh, of accuracy. Oh, Even improving, problem. if possible. So uh, are there any questions from the uh, audience? to the panel. I do have a question, but it's more like a, a technical, if I may. Uh, for mm -hmm. Sebastian or for Anne, uh, so you said that you apply the super resolution algorithm, but my question is, uh, uh, is there any threshold on images in the temporal uh, range that you you use to to apply this to to get your uh, super resolution image, the output image, and uh, what are the metrics that you are 
using to assess the quality of the image in terms of sharpness and uh, uh, um, blue blur motion or or whatever uh, metrics are you using for the assessment of the quality of the image? Okay, I can reply, Fion. Sure. Sure. Um, what 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 happened is that uh, well, we we develop a vi okay. So theoretically, there is some some equations. So there is a you can see on the sum there, there are objects, so there is a theoretical form formulation of a process that might be with propagation that might help us to to, to understand uh, what what error we are we are doing. But also uh, there is a, you know it is a temporal algorithm. So I think you spot a very good point because uh, with temporal you you need to predict because at the beginning when we develop and to like goes for real time purposes. It means that we have no view on the future. So to produce a fusion at a given date, we only uh, can be based on the past. So we are forced to, to predict the information. So if you want to predict, you, want, you, you have to use a model and you have to use a linear model or quadratic or voilà. So uh, de depending on the model you want to use, uh, you, you, you will need more or less a uh, number of products in the past. So the, um, we, we speak uh, with, uh, with, with a linear model, so we just need two products in the past, but it is possible to extend this and to use more products. So this is the second point. And the, and the, the, last, the last point is actually when you, we produce the, the 10 meter data, we, uh, we, we have a very, very simple uh, process that is uh, called uh, auto-check, where we, we degrade the fusion product at 10 meters, L2F. We degrade it to, to 30 meters, so don't set eight um, resolution, and we compare both. And uh, if we detect uh, error, we, uh, we, we flag pixel, for which we estimate that uh, the difference is, is, is too high. Voilà. So it is really simple methods. Huh? And, and we have in the configuration, there is a threshold and um, in terms of, of, of percent. And we, do, we did the same for BRDF also. There is some threshold uh, where we do not accept uh, the correction and we flag a pixel and we say that it is not possible uh, to predict uh, the value uh, and to fuse uh, the pixel, uh, voilà. So we flag it on uh, based on this uh, on this principle. Okay, wow. Thank you. Thanks, Ra. Uh, thanks, Sebastian. Um, any one last question? Otherwise, I'll ask the panel to give some closing comments. Okay, if not, maybe I'll start with you, Farhan. Any closing comments? Um, yeah, may, maybe overall about this harmonization fusion, we, we are really excited. I think there is uh, a lot of potential and it has been under uh, use um, in the past. Uh, I mean, we have these two projects, HLS started, there, there were activities in the past also of. Uh, uh, harmonizing and um, and fusing uh, modis with Landsat. Uh, th th there are some activities, but uh, up to now it we have struggled in order to make all these uh, products operational. I think the next, the very next step is to really uh, bring these products to the broad public. I think uh, on NASA side uh, you're, you're you're more advanced, and that's that's really great because it this might open the the path. Uh, on either side, uh, we, we believe that uh, there is a great potential for this type of products, uh, for integrating new missions and for, uh, we have more and more missions being launched uh, and, and, and there is clear synergy between these missions that can be reached. We, we could go beyond, as uh, Brian said, uh, also integrating radar, uh, uh, mm -hmm. microwave uh, imaging in, in, the, in the scope, but that, that might come a bit later and there, is, there are also 
uh, are certain actors already doing that on the, on the private sector? On either side, uh, we do not have much activity there, but on, on, in, in Europe, there are companies already working on that. Uh, so we might leave that more for, for the commercial sector, but just uh, focusing on this very first step of uh, having an harmonized, fused uh, time series of optical data, I think that we really need to move forward and, and, and provide this operationally to, to users in a, on a large scale. So exciting times ahead for, for this domain, I think. Thanks, Ron. Well put. Uh, Jeff? Yeah. I think Ron summed it up. I mean, we're living in a very data rich world right now. I mean, I think um, just back in 2011, we had one Landsat on orbit uh, because of Landsat 5, it sort of ceased operations. We get data every 16 days. Now we have data every day, um, multiple types of data every day from both the government and commercial systems. And so um, these sorts of harmonization approaches, I think, are, are really uh, valuable in the way of, way of the future. The only thing I'll say also is that the next challenge, you know, we've, we've talked about the cloud and we've surmounted the challenge of doing the processing in the cloud. But I think the next challenge is letting people analyze these large time series data sets within the cloud. So they're not having to drag them to their desktop computers because that's that's a very 1990s approach um, in a way. And so, um, you know, things like Google Earth Engine and that kind of framework, I think are gonna be um, very valuable moving forward to really exploiting um, the types of products we're talking about here, not necessarily Google Earth Engine, but things like that, where um, you know, you're able to bring algorithms to the data rather than bring the data back to your desktop computers. And I think that's maybe the next challenge we all have to face. Thanks, Jeff. I, I would like to add personally, I think it's been a pleasure for us to work with you on this project. And Brian. Thank you. And I think it's been a pleasure to uh, to work with with Isa and Farhan as well. So it's been a collaborative. That's right. Definitely, same for from our side. Brian, yeah, sure. So I, I think you know I think Farhan and Jeff kind of hit the, the nail on the head there with you know, their closing thoughts. I think you know from Farhan's point, I think that you know we're in a, an area or a time frame where. You know, I think we're starting to change our thought process when we launch a mission. Not only does it achieve our agency objectives, but are there global objectives? And then can we kind of work across agencies to kind of have uh, a single vision for a specific mission when we, you know, when we launch these new missions into space? Because they are becoming more expensive. They are producing more data. And so they only become useful if, you know, more people are able to use them. And so I think one of the things that, you know, makes harmonization and data fusion possible is the, you know, free and open uh Data, data policy. So you want to have free and open software so that, you know, users like the ones that have listened today can go out and maybe test the algorithm on their own and, and validate, you know, if there's anything that maybe we've overlooked. Um, and I think, you know, the, the other side of that is being able to have access to the data. So, I mean, I think, you know, for NASA's perspective, you know, we're starting to really look into having that open source data policy um, to kind of promote these activities moving forward into the future. And I think that's really important to kind of, you know, change our mindset around that a little bit too. Uh, to make sure that you know everybody's on board with that you know we can only harmonize with the data that we have access to um, and so i think that's something that's really useful i think um you know to just perspective with you know data access you know that's kind of teeing us up i think nasa is starting to kind of look into the potential for us to actually you know move that data processing from somebody's local computer off onto the cloud because i think that again these data volumes that we're starting to talk about with these missions that are coming on board, it only makes sense for us to start using that data natively in the cloud rather than egressing it back out. And so there is some um, investigation that's going to be done there. And I think, you know, everybody's kind of on the same page here where, you know, we need to start preparing for the next wave and next generation of missions. And to do that, I think we've got to have a free and open data source policy, start to look into these harmonization projects. And then also work on these visualization user access uh, platforms that can kind of really drive the user experience forward. Um, so I think that's pretty much all. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Yeah. So I think on behalf of everyone, I'd like to thank the panel. Uh, you know, and Afran and Sebastian, it's really not the best time for you in Europe. Uh, thank you for taking you know time to participate in the webinar. Uh, we really appreciate it. I think this was great and. And Jeff and Ron, thank you again. Um, and thank I'd you. also like to thank all the people who 
called in to listen to this uh, fantastic presentations and discussions. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. Good.